if I can tell if it's, yeah. I got a new microphone. Uh, TJ was loaning me his. I really liked him, so I, I purchased some. He said he's gonna be watching from home, so thank you, TJ, for sending me the link to this. this. We're gonna go to the Lord in prayer, and, and again, we have uh, many special needs or people that are in a bad way. Several people have had strokes. Um, it's good to see Sister Moody here tonight doing well. But some folks aren't doing as well as Sister Moody is here tonight, and some are, are hanging on by a thread. Um, some are doing better, um, Pam, and um, but others, uh, Kenrick's back in the hospital. He's got some things going on, and um, remember Jimmy and prayer, uh, Kim's dad. So we got a lot of needs and people that need prayer and need a healing touch, and um, praising God for um, for my cousin's wife's healing, but he needs a healing in his back. And uh, he was hoping to have surgery, but there's some preconditions before they'll give him surgery. I know he's disappointed because he was really looking forward. He had heard so many good reports. Some When we were at the family reunion, one of our other cousins, her son had this surgery, and she said it was like within six weeks, he's like a new man. And uh, so I was kind of anxious to see how my cousin Tim did, because at some point down the line, I, I still have herniated discs, so, um, but thank God I'm, I'm able to function and not in significant pain, but uh, maybe you're here and you have a special need. just want to say, Lord, you know my need. I'm right here, Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do love you. We bless your holy name. You are great and greatly to be praised. Lord, I pray for each of these needs that I just lifted up, God, Lord, those that are recovering from from a stroke or from, uh, Lord, other issues going on, respiratory issues. Lord, I pray that you would touch them and heal them. God, I pray tonight, Lord, that you would minister, um, God, to, to our church, God, our desire is to glorify and honor you, whether it's on Wednesday night or Sunday or any of our other meetings during the week that, God, we get together to, to honor you and study you. Where I pray, God, that you would just, uh, Lord, be glorified and that, Lord, you would God, help us to speak those things that will build up the kingdom of God and edify fellow believers. Pray tonight, Lord, that you touch me as I bring forth this lesson as we explore what the church of God believes and why we believe it and the biblical foundation for what we believe, God. And I just praise you for who you are and what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen and amen. I want to, uh, my battery died in my clicker, so I'm going to have to use this. But it's okay, I'm standing right here. Remember uh, last week when I was talking about how the Church of God ended up developing, it's what we call a declaration of faith. We don't use the word creed because we don't believe in creeds, but our declaration of faith sounds suspiciously like a creed. And uh, But one of the things that motivated us, Church of God got involved with the National Association of Evangelicals. They had, and the Church of God was, on the, was one of the founding organizations for that. And um, so... Is that, uh, I'm trying to, I was looking for Sandra. Is she not here tonight? Her wallet's back there on the table. So um, anyway, um, because the National Association of Evangelicals required, you know, together, the Church of God and others, they develop a statement of faith. You know, this is what we believe and this is what people, they're going to be members of this association. You may be Pentecostal or not Pentecostal. You may be Baptist or not Baptist, Calvinist, Armenian, but... These are some core beliefs that we're all going to agree to. And uh, one of the, the, the first one is we believe the Bible to be the inspired, the only infallible, authoritative word of God. And so that kind of set the, um, the pace for the Church of God as it began to develop its own declaration of faith. And as I said last week, the Church of God was kind of motivated in part because of this and because of our learning institutions for accreditation with Christian accrediting agencies. They require you to have a statement of faith for your teachers all to say, this is what we believe, this is what we teach. In fact, I went online um, today and was studying Lee University statement of faith. I don't know if you know it, but there's another Lee University. The other one's in Texas. And I pulled up the wrong one and I was reading it and I was like, What? I was about ready to post something mean and say, I can't believe. And I thought, this can't be Lee University of Cleveland, Tennessee. So I went back and looked. That one was down in Tyler, Texas, I think. Uh, I'm glad I didn't say anything mean. It's always good to check twice, right? What, how do they say? Measure twice, cut once. And um, so um, 
the, the Church of God, like other institutions, they were developing uh, our statement of faith that became our declaration of, of faith. And as I said, it, it, it was done rather hastily during a general assembly and uh, they voted it in, and the, the anticipation was that there, it might be re, uh, revised, or um, things might. So there's nothing in our statement about the church at all. There's, you know, other uh, the Nicene Creed, other creeds talk about the church, but our statement of faith doesn't really mention the church at all. And so, but it kind of got put on a banner and hung in churches, and it's a law of the Medes and the Purge. So, uh, anyway, I am appreciative of the fact that our first statement, our first, we call them articles, first article in our declaration of faith is that we believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. Now, if you go back, you're going to notice the uh, NAE said we believe in the inspired, the only infallible authoritative word of God. Now, the Church of God did not add the word infallible, and I think reason why they certainly did believe at that time especially and hopefully still that the word of God is infallible but their thought was if you believe in the verbal inspiration how can you believe anything other than that it is infallible and so I a few years ago I taught something called contemporary theology and I got into the whole history of how theology developed uh, contemporary theology and I didn't go back to like Augustine or Augustine, however you want to pronounce it, and uh, some Tertullian and those guys' origin. But it was contemporary. It really started with the First World War at the beginning of the 20th century. And um, maybe going back to the, the 19th century, but one of the things that, that happened over time was as, as there was a move toward more liberal, actually there was a branch of theology called liberal theology, and one of the first things they attack is the veracity of the Bible. You kind of have to. If you want to go off on all these tangents about, you know, homosexuality is not a sin, then you kind of have to deny that the Bible means what it says because it clearly says in, in, in the New Testament. I'm not talking about stoning people in the Old Testament. I'm talking about in Romans, I think even chapter 1, uh, men with men doing that which is unseemly or ungodly or whatever the word was they use there, but clearly saying that this is wrong. Well, Infallible and inerrant. We'll look at what that means. Um, these two words um, are similar. Um, as I said, the NAE, the National Associate Evangelical, states we believe the Bible to be the inspired, the only infallible authoritative word of God. The only. So the Book of Mormon, no. Uh, any other addition, anything you add to it, no. That's not uh, the infallible authoritative word of God. It is only. Now, God reveals himself to us in two ways. This thing, one of the things you teach in theology, is it's called special revelation and general revelation. God reveals himself to us in nature. And the Bible says, day in the day are speech, night in the night, gives knowledge. And, um, and there are other places where the Bible talks about that. There is a general revelation that there is a God. It's not specific enough to... You know, you, I know in, we used to be taught that the dogwood flower represented the cross because you had the little burnt marks at the top and the sides and the middle looked like a, a crown of thorns. And you could go into the woods and find a dogwood flower and suddenly have the whole gospel of Jesus just dropped on you miraculously. Probably not because Paul said, how should they believe unless they hear? Hear. Faith comes by <laughs> and hearing by the word of God. He said, how should they believe unless they hear? And how should they hear? Unless someone is sent, unless someone goes and has written, how beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news. There has to be a preacher, a speaker, an evangelist, a missionary. There has to be someone, a proclaimer of the gospel. But there is general revelation so that all men are without excuse. Nature itself declares there is a creator. There's no creation without a creator. And if you wake up and see the creation, then you have no excuse for not believing there is a creator. And that, that, that um, awakening uh, to the reality of the creator moves us ever closer to the cross so that we come to that place. Or God, I've heard of God doing it in miraculous ways. I've heard people say angels came and different things. But I'm going to tell you, the main way, the primary way, is you and me telling other people, that 
I, I want to be someone who tells everyone about someone who can save anyone. I mean, that ought to be our, our goal. So um, the infallible word of God. Conservative scholars maintain that the Bible is both infallible and inerrant. Now, it's not stated in our first article, but uh, conservative scholars believe that. And again, as liberal theology advanced, they had to keep doing away with. And we'll look at different ideas about what they believe the Bible is. Um, and infallibility means incapable of making a mistake. So if the Bible is infallible, it can't make mistakes. Because what's another, what's another name, some other names for the Bible? Word of God. Word of God, all right, right away. The Word of God. So if it is the Word of God, is God a man that he should lie? Or the Son of Man that he should repent? No. So God's Word cannot be in error. So, and we'll look again as we go along. So infallibility means incapable of making a mistake, while inerrancy means the absence of any factual error. And this is where some people really... Uh, scoff at it you know the bible says this and the bible says that and we know that isn't true we know that the, the sun doesn't rise the earth turns on its axis but it says the bible you know that the sun rises and i was like i know people with phds that say the sun rises so watch the sunset. and they watch the sun set yeah we know but that's the the language that we use to describe the phenomenon that we observe and talking to anybody that's like Well, in part, there is a way to interpret Scripture in such a way that you can remain true to the original intent that God... That, but you're right. For believers, the Bible says the Holy Spirit illuminates the Scriptures to our heart. An unbeliever can memorize Scripture from front to back and still not know what it means. In fact... You know I mean? I can have, find something to argue with. Right. Well, Paul talks about... Or there's a Peter that talks about... The, the Jewish people who rejected Christ, they said there, there was a veil over their face. It was part of judgment for the rebellion against God. And he said there's a veil over their face that remains to this day. So that they, they, don't, they don't see as part of the judgment for their rejection, well, for not living according to the commandments in the Old Covenant and not receiving Christ or recognizing him in the New Covenant. So I love uh, Dr. Arrington. He's like 92 or something, still sharp as a tack. And, uh, but... One of his books is, uh, is called Exploring the Declaration of Faith. I referred to it. He said, The Bible is the voice of God speaking to humans across the centuries. It is God's message to us. In fact, it is the primary manner in which God speaks to us. I know the Holy Spirit puts things on our heart, and we sometimes, in talking to people, and the general revelation, you know, we wake up and we... Ex we sense God's presence and all this, but the primary way that God speaks to us, people say, I wonder why God isn't still speaking. He is still speaking. We're just not listening, right? <laughs> now, in the last days, it said he would send a famine of the hearing of his word. And he's talking about there, would be a, uh, there wouldn't be many prophets hearing and proclaiming God's word. But, and then he says, God inspired both the ideas and the words of scripture. So Dr. Arrington clearly believes in the infallibility and the inerrancy of scripture. But we state, we, we don't use the words infallible or inerrant, we state that we believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. So we're going to break down what that first, that's a very short, and Brother Regis is going to be teaching a few weeks from now about Jesus. That's a real long article, and we may break it into two lessons, but this one, very straightforward. And at the last General Assembly, they were talking about... Um, and I got brought into the conversation. I helped write some documents that ended up in the, um, some of the wording ended up in the minutes, I think. I wasn't there because I had COVID, so I was in my hotel room watching online. But um, the idea of do we call God she or mother? Uh, can we use those terms for God? Because God is a spirit and all of this. And I just said, listen, what's our first article of the Declaration of Faith? Said, we believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. So what does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, we believe. We have something we believe in, and it's important to know what we believe. I know in whom I have believed, and he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We ought to be able to know some things. And, um, and so we believe in the verbal. The verbal means that the very words of the original manuscripts 
came from God through holy men. And we're gonna we're gonna break a lot of this down. I, I'll probably run out of time because this is a deep subject. Uh, we believe in the verbal inspiration. The word inspiration, and I'll show you the verse in a while, means God breathed. Yes, sir. And like the most like respectful way possible. All the like when back then when like Paul was like writing his terms, it's like women know how to like write. Oh well, that's a debate. They had the early schools that Jewish all Jewish boys went to, the equivalent to going through what we call high school. There's a whole debate about whether women were required to, or if they even had the option to go um, to school. Some Jewish scholars think that women could, and often did, um, but men were required to go uh, to, to study and to know the word. So uh, I would say there, there are many examples in the scripture of very successful business women like Lydia, who ran her own business. She obviously is a very educated, I would think, educated woman able to run a business, uh, sell her a purple, which was very expensive dye. So we believe that in the verbal inspiration that God inspired in the verbal inspiration of the Bible, the Bible, it's unlike any other book. You know, uh, Joseph Smith claimed he got these tablets of gold from the angel Moroni and nobody saw them but him. And he would get under his blankets at night and he would read to his wife and she wrote down the Book of Mormon. She never saw the golden tablets. And if you read the Book of Mormon, I don't recommend it, but I've read large portions of it. Um, it's just a lot of plagiarism of scripture plus a lot of just fiction. And he marries it together. So he's under there going through the Bible, putting in parts from the Bible, and then also including just made up stuff. Because he didn't want his wife, his own wife, to know there are no golden tablets. And so if you ask for years, if you ask the Mormons, well, what happened to the golden tablets? That was my first thing I would ask him when they came. And they're like, oh, we don't know. And I'm like, now they have an answer. Now the answer is the angel came and took them back. All right. Yeah, okay. Whatever. But we believe the Bible, not the Quran. The Quran also is full of biblical uh, plagiarism. They, if you've read any of it. They have big chunks and big segments that come from the Bible, and they try to incorporate it into this. And um, in that case, it was um, Muhammad who claimed that an angel delivered this to him. He, he, Muhammad was illiterate. He could neither read nor write. But he would come back, and he would recite what he claimed the angel gave him to people who could write, and they wrote it down. And this happened over a period of, of maybe years, certainly months. Anyway, um, so we believe in that, in the verbal inspiration. So does verbal inspiration of the Bible also mean that we believe the Bible is without error, impossible in, in, to have error? Well, the word verbal inspiration means that God used the exact words and vocabulary of the biblical author to say exactly what he, God, intended to say. Uh, I guess I was naive when I went to seminary. I, I had what's called the dictation uh, view of of inspiration. I felt almost like these writers fell into a trance and the Holy Spirit just used them like typewriters. You know, they were just dictating. But there's there's so much variation in the personalities. well their personalities come out in their writing, exactly right. And so God was using the vocabulary and the histories and the personalities, but God used their words to say exactly what God wanted to say. I mean God could have invented words and give them to them, but then who would know what they were talking about? Um, it'd be speaking with an uncertain sound, you know, like a trumpet that nobody understands what it's for. Paul talks about that. So if God gave the words, can those words contain error? Can God speak error? I would say no, <laughs> because he's omnipotent and omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing. And he could use exactly the vocabulary of John or Peter, a fisherman, and, uh, and say exactly what God intended to communicate to us. And that's how he did that. Um, it's interesting, uh, someone brought this out to, uh, when I was, again, when I was a seminary, I'd read through the Bible, and especially the New Testament. I never noticed in, in Romans, toward the end of it, Paul used what, when he wrote, uh, we often think of Paul sitting and writing like the picture I show on Sunday mornings. But Paul used what's called an amanuensis, which is a fancy word for like a secretary. 
And his secretary, one of them in Romans, his name is Tertius. And I, Tertius, by whose hand this epistle is written, greet thee. He was writing as Paul spoke. Yeah. And so, uh, and there may have been revisions along the way. No, no, no. Strike that. Let's put it this way. We don't know. I mean, we never found revisions and stuff lined out on it like we might think. But because um, we have none of the original manuscripts um, from when Paul wrote or even a copy of a copy or, or even a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of what we have actually come uh, probably hundreds of years later. Now, there's some ancient texts from Isaiah that predate Jesus that we have. And what we found, we found this, the oldest from the Masoretic, uh, from, from the, uh, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, found this old, 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 old copy of Isaiah. And when you compare it with the Masoretic text, which was the Hebrew interpretation or the Hebrew copy of the Old Testament, we found that it was very, you know, very tight. I mean, what you saw here was what was written here. And anyway, um, so here we go. If God gave the words, can they contain errors? And some would say, well, what about things that look scientifically wrong? Again, God was using the vocabulary of the people of that time. And so they described the phenomena as they saw them. It's not a science book, but where it addresses scientific issues, it is accurate. Um, and there are many examples of this that you can point to where historians, for example, said, oh, this city didn't exist. Um, Mary Magdalene, where, where did she come from? You know, was that her dad's last name? Magdala. And then in, in the 2000s, within the last 20 years, they found Magdala. They found the city with a, um, I've been there. Did you guys go to Magdala? There's a, an old uh, synagogue there with a parquet floor from the time of Jesus. Jesus almost certainly stood right there and taught. And it's there. So things that they say aren't there. Unlike the Book of Mormon, who claims that, uh, that uh, describes these big battles in South America with the people riding up on these horses, glistening in armor and these waving fields of wheat and all of this. Historically, they were describing a time before the Europeans came. The Europeans brought the horses. There were no horses during that time. The wheat that they described came with the Europeans. <laughs> they describe stuff that's historically inaccurate. Now, they're not stupid. And, you know, you got Brigham Young and they have historians. And they basically pass it off by saying, well, you know, you have to take these things, um, you know, the grand, you know, it was meant to communicate something. Or some would say, well, it's prophetic. It was about things that were going to happen. Yeah, but you couch it in terms of history, things that have not happened, that did not happen, that could not have happened. They describe these big walled cities and there are no remnants. Now we know about the Aztecs and the Mayan ruins and all that. But that's not what they're talking about. They make up names of Indian tribes that never existed. Native Americans. And um, it's just patently false on the face of it, which is why uh, I, could, I could never have voted for Mitt Romney for president because I, my opinion is anybody that could believe that cannot be my president. <laughs> sorry. Not, sorry, not sorry. Um, so some say, what about the various translations? That's where we have a proliferation of translations. We grew up, you know, it was a King James Bible, and you got to this day, you got KJV only people. If you, I preached out of the New King James, which is very similar, and saw a woman just fold her Bible and cross her arms like she's I trying to. I'm surprised she didn't actually put her fingers in her ear. Um, and I was like, why? Why are you so opposed? They're, they're, they translate from the, um, the original languages, the, the, many of them. Now, some are like the message. I don't mess with the message. It's not a, it's not an, it's not a translation. It's a paraphrase. A guy, one guy, not a committee, not scholars. One guy sat down. He read one of the English translations and he just put it in his own words. That's not scholarship. Now you may like the message, but I'm going to tell you, it's not scholarship. <laughs> if it inspires you, great, but uh, it's not scholarship. So um, these translations came out because. The, uh, the Old Testament was mostly written in Hebrew and Aramaic. And the New Testament, as far as we know, every book in the New Testament was written in what's called Koine Greek. It's kind of, people couldn't understand it. It's not classical Greek. And for years, scholars were like, what is this? Is this a made-up Greek? What is this? They finally come to understand 
It was like the common Greek spoken on the street by people. It's like common man uh, language. Slang. Yeah. Well, not, not even slang. It's just like the common man on the street. They wouldn't be trying to talk this highbrow. Yeah, that's not right. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so they found out, no, this was a real language from that time period, and it is accurate. Um, so in... When you translate something, first of all, even the English language is dynamic. In other words, it changes over time, right? The meaning of words change. He that letteth shall let until he that it hindereth is removed. You know, talking about the Antichrist, letteth. What does let mean? I mean, in English right now, what does let mean? To let, to allow, right? He that allows will allow. But if you go back to, and I have old dictionaries from the 1600s, the word letteth was also meant at that time it was meant to hinder that's why you have modern translation says he that hinders shall hinder until that which hinders is removed and uh so i've met people who were just kjv only to the hilt and um they were reading that very verse i said tell me what that means well it means that that there's an agency in the world that's allowing i was like that's the exact opposite of what it means and when you go to the greek from which the, the word let is translated you realize it means to hinder. So the English language changes over time. That's why sometimes you have to use more contemporary translations unless you're willing to go to the original languages like I do and, and look at what it meant in the Greek. Then, so there are different translations. But then like as the language changes, the understanding of the people that are reading it don't understand Right, they don't understand the old language. You know, it's like, like in the King James Version, the way most people in the South pronounce it, thus saith the Lord. So, two syllables. Most of you pronounce it that way, but I looked up the right way to pronounce it, and it's Seth, thus saith the Lord. Not saith, it's not two syllables, it's one syllable. So now that I've taught you that, I don't ever want to hear you say it wrong again. <laughs> thus saith the Lord. But these, again, it's dynamic. So there are different translations and there continue to be, uh, and it doesn't, the idea is to get to the original, understand exactly what it meant, and then put it in the language that we can understand now. Let me give you an example of the KG. One of the first, uh, one of the equivalent, what we would call KJV only, in South Korea, there was a Korean Bible. Koreans loved this Bible. It was the Bible. I remember someone told me one time, I asked a friend of mine, I said, why are you so... KJV only. He says, well, that's what the pilgrims brought, and that's what made America great. And I did some research, and I think it was the Geneva Bible, that that because the new the King James Version was too new, and the pilgrims were like, oh, no, that's a new translation. We have the Geneva Bible. That's what we're going to use. So even back then, and I remember telling him that, and he was like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I remember another guy, I was like, have you read the 1611 King James Version? The way they spell milk, for example. I mean, the way they spell words is so different than what we call the King James. They changed it. And I went to visit him one time, and he was like, I got a 1611 King James Bible. I was like, can you read it? And it was in the print of some of the old, um, the, what was that, the first uh, printing press? Um, Gutenberg. Gutenberg. First thing he printed on the Gutenberg Bible, or on the Gutenberg Press, was the Bible. And so I asked him, I said, uh, well, do you, do you preach the Apocrypha? And he's like, what's that? I said, the Apocrypha is the books that were in the original King James that are between the Old and New Testament. They're not considered inspired, but they were in the, he said, is it in there? I said, if it's an original, it is. And sure enough, and he was like, he didn't know what to make of that or what to do with it, you know. What do you got? Yeah, no, but we have ancient, ancient, yeah, but... If you really want to read the Greek part, you can even do that. You could, but I think most good translations that were done by scholars, I met Bruce Metzger, for example. He he was a great uh, New Testament Greek scholar, and he helped write, uh, he was one of the editors on the New Revised Standard Version, and I got to talk to him about why in the New Revised Standard Version they changed the word tongues to language. Why do you think they would change the word tongues to language? Because the Greek word means language. We got, you know, we like being Pentecostal. We like the word tongues. I spoke in tongues. 
Literally, it means languages, and that's what he said. He said, you know, we're just trying to be true to what the original, to what the Greek meant. It meant languages. I know we got in this habit of saying tongues. Pastor, the way I've expressed it is this. The message doesn't change, but the words we use change, and if we don't use new words, the message gets lost. It does, and so we still have, the good thing is, we still have uh, the, the ancient texts to uh, compare it to, if if you can if you can study in a, in in one of the biblical, I don't know Old Testament, I don't know Hebrew or Aramaic, but I know people who do, and they explain. You know, I can ask them. You know, what does this mean? And and they can explain it. Yes, sir. One more thing. Um, how I guess tongues is translated as a language. You know how we have a, somebody in church that every once in a while will like, say, and then immediately after she'll say like, yeah, interpretation. What it was. Mm -hmm. like say different language and then she'll you know, translate it into English before mm -hmm. it's all. It yeah, and we call that in the New Testament, they refer to that as interpretation as opposed to translation because when you're going from one language to another, a, a word for word translation yeah. may not make sense because the word order in Greek, for example, is quite different from English and so you have to put it, to put it in English, you have to, you have to put it in a way that is comprehensible to an English speaking audience. So what happened was there was this the Koreans had this Bible, the Korean Bible, the only one they would, they would go by for years and years. Because Christianity in South Korea, through the Presbyterians, it goes back a long time. And um, it's, a, it's a Christian country. But their version came from Chinese. So the Chinese, from what I understand, translated from the King James into the Chinese, then from the Chinese into Korean. And when you go through languages like that, from one language to another to another, it really changes so that when their scholars then learn the biblical languages and then they compared it to this Korean Bible, which was their their version, their equivalency of a King James version, they're like, that's not what that says at all. <laughs> so you've got to go back to the touchstone. I think that's why we have to trust um, good scholarship. We Not all scholarship is good. Like the, uh, the NIV, I, I feel like it has some issues. It's a dynamic translation. It tries to put it in more dynamic equivalency uh, using the Old Testament words. But then they came out with uh, what was called the, um, it was like T and IV, I think is what it was. And that was one where they were doing all these gender equivalent uh, for God, you know. Uh, they, instead of calling God Father, they called God Parent. And they, they just, and that Bible did not, I think they shut it down. Right? I don't even know if you could find one, but it did not work. But what's going on in the world today? Yeah, if you look at it, go through and look at it. Uh, the Lord's Prayer probably says our parent, which art in heaven or whatever, our gender neutral person who is in heaven. Uh, but so how do we understand if it's not dictation, if they didn't fall into a trance? So um, uh, Don Walker actually wrote this in another of the books on the of the um, Declaration of Faith. And he said, we don't believe in the agnostic view, which object, objects to the divine origin of the Bible and confesses only its sublimity as script, as literature. In other words, they think it's a beautiful book and it's inspired to the extent that it might make us happy or sad or whatever. They look at it as a, as a piece of literature. Yeah, almost like Shakespeare. And they say it's it's wonderful. <laughs> I love the... the uh, the Muslims will say their script, the Aramaic, is the most beautiful sacred scripture ever written. That's rather subjective. What if you like the way the English letters look, especially in cursive? So anyway, there's the agnostic view. Of course, we reject that. There's the liberal religionist view, which compromises to assert that the Bible contains the word of God. In other words, yeah, it kind of expresses God's feelings, but the words really are irrelevant. We have to understand it's just... Uh, it's just expressing ideas like God is, you know, love or whatever. Uh, the concept that those who wrote the scriptures did it through super sensitivity or aesthetic response to spiritual matters. In other words, these were like super spiritual people and they got these feelings about God and how he relates to man. And so they wrote, you know, they wrote. It wasn't inspired. It was just them being inspired, but not inspired by the Holy Spirit. And then... We would reject the uh, concept theory which holds God revealed his truth to holy men and left to their disposition the precise words to be used. In other words, God says, I created the earth, you fill in the rest. <laughs> Seven days. 
you know, he gives them the concepts, you know, there has to be a atoning sacrifice. Okay, we'll put lambs in the Old Testament, and Jesus, and so that's not it. it. God inspired the words. And then there's the view that the writers were, uh, were mere machines. I talked about this, the dictation theory. Uh, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Certainly, the Holy Spirit initiated the writing of Scripture. In other words, Paul didn't just wake up and say, you know, I think I'll write some Scripture today. No, the Holy Spirit was moving on him and saying, here are issues in this church that need to be addressed. And as you address these, this letter is going gonna, gonna to speak to the church through the millennia. And so the Holy Spirit was with him as he, as he wrote. It is important to know what you believe. Second Peter chapter three verses thirteen through eighteen says, "You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness." He's talking about false teachings trying to come in, being led away with the error of the wicked. So you need to know what you believe, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You need, he, we're told to grow in grace and knowledge. We should be always be lifelong students of the word to him. Be the glory both now and forever. Blake, you want to hand these out for me? I was reading, just doing a little bit of research, and there's an article there um, called 33 Verses About the Infallibility of the Bible being from, uh, which was from a blog called The Lord is Our Shepherd. And I, you know, not all blogs are, can, are equal. So I looked into it and uh, very conservative. And uh, this was a list that was on there, like a PowerPoint slide. I don't know why they use different type font for just about every one of those verses. So they found 33 verses, but I narrowed it down. I wanted to give you just 20 uh, to look at that really affirm that God's word is inspired, that it is infallible, that it is inerrant. And um, I just want to go around the room and uh, just... Read it out loud. If you don't like to read in public, just say pass. Some people don't like to read in public. So if you don't want to, pass, pass, pass. In our home church in West Virginia, we go around the sanctuary every Sunday and uh, everybody reads a verse. We used to do it like that. And, and uh, there was always someone that was like, pass. Um, but I'm going to read this first one. And I want to mention this is where that word inspiration comes from. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The word inspiration is from the Greek word theophanous, theos, God, uh, nousis, um, breathe, breath, air, wind. It's God breathed. So God is breathing this. Uh, again, it's not dictation. God's breathing upon them, inspiring them. And then he's using their language as he inspires them to write the words using their language, their personalities, their their personal history. Okay, um, let's go with Blake. Number two, Blake. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy truth is the word. So God's word is truth. It's true. And we need to know that. Um, Beverly? And now, O Lord God, thou art, thou art that God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised to this goodness and to thy truth. So his words are true. Again, if, if anybody don't want to read, just say pass. Do uh, you want to go back here? you want to read? Any of you? Hey, pick one. Uh, we're on number four. Okay. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God elect and the knowledge of truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world begins. Again, God cannot lie. In fact, you're going to see that phrase over and over. God cannot lie. Next, who's next? Am I read or pass? Back here? Yes. I know people watching online aren't hearing this, so um, I'm not going to repeat it, but that, I'll just repeat that verse that was read, Numbers 23, 19. Okay, uh, next. The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver, tried in a furnace, a pearl, 
So, Psalm 12, 6. Uh, next back here, Marianne. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. See a theme there? God cannot lie. Hebrews um, 6, 18. Uh, I, can't, I have my glasses off, so whoever's next, read, please. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them. Proverbs 35. So his words are not only true, his words, he cannot lie, his words are pure. Next. For this cause also thank you God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of man, but as it is, but, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in me that you believe. 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. So, uh, as you notice, anybody know what translation this is? King James Version. <laughs> That's why some of you are struggling with it, I can tell. Um, I was going to change it over, but I was running behind. I copied this from this webpage just as, a, as, it, as it was and, and pasted it. So, I didn't have time to go through and look them all up in the New King James Version. Next, Romans 3, 4, please. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but let every man be a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sins, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Romans 3, 4. God be true. Psalm 119, 89, next. Forever, O Lord, thou word is settled in heaven. Mm-hmm. 1 Corinthians 2.13, please. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So Paul's saying here that his teaching, his writing, was being um, guided by the Holy Spirit, was being led by the Holy Spirit. Um, 2 Samuel 23.2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. And his word was in my tongue. Second Samuel 23. And we'll let Dr. Paul Jones get the, one of the shortest ones. <laughs> and God spake all these things, saying. So the, the words of the Old Testament. Go ahead and read the next one since you're on it. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That word moved is from the Greek word uh, pharaoh, meaning carried by. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uh, moved upon them to, to write or to speak as prophets. And, uh, and then the, maybe later their words were inscripturated, uh, put in scripture. Um, but it was the Holy Spirit who initiates it, guides over it, carries them along, and presents it. I don't know if the Revised Standard Version uses the term Holy Ghost or not, but um, and, and there are some people, I mean, that's all they want to say is Holy Ghost. It's, it's good enough for the King James, good enough for them. I will say this, I, and our Declaration of Faith uses the word Holy Ghost throughout. I prefer to use the word Holy Spirit. In the Greek, it's pneumatos in the New Testament, ruach in the, in the Old Testament, and uh, for some reason, the King James translators in some places translate it ghost, which almost gives you this imagery of a ghost, like a, uh, like a Casper the ghost, right? In one place at one time, a spirit, the spirit of God is pervasive. The spirit of God pervades the entire universe. Pastor, one of the things that happens in all living languages, words change. They change their meaning. When the King James Version was written, the word spirit had a bad, fearful connotation. The word ghost didn't. Now it's exactly the opposite. Yeah. Well, so the that's word, why we've changed. Well, the word spirit is from the Latin. They got it from Jerome's Latin Vulgate, and it was spiritus. And so they used... The, uh, the King James Version relied heavily upon the, um, uh, the Latin, Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Jerome was an ancient scholar that translated the Bible, Old and New Testament. It's like, again, it's like a one person, not a scholarship, not a team. He translated, he was a good scholar. He was a sharp man. I mean, to Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and to 
put it into Latin. Um, but what happened was many times, the King James translators, if there was like a, a conflict between the Latin and the, and the Greek, for example, they would almost default to the, the Latin. Let me give you an example. I just learned this a couple years ago when I was talking to a, a fellow scholar. How many of you know the word Calvary? Calvary covers it all. All the songs, right? Yeah. Calvary. It's a beautiful, we love that word. That word's not in the Greek. That word is only in the Latin, and it got carried over in the King James, and we love it. But it's not in the original Greek at all. And it's hard to shake that loose. Well, I was like, are you sure? So I had to go in, and I looked in the Greek, and hey, this guy's really sharp. I mean, uh, he's a Hebrew scholar, but um, I was like, okay. Now, that's heresy. I'll probably get put out of the church of God for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can. You can read 16? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, then the scripture cannot be broken. Yeah, if the Bible calls them that, then you can't go against the scripture. Um, I read 17. The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of God shall stand forever. Isaiah 48. And just for the sake of online and time, I'll read the next one. As also in all his epistles. This is an important one here, and I'm going to tell you why. Paul, Peter here is writing about Paul. He's talking about Paul, the Apostle Paul. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things are hard to understand. That's what Peter's saying. Some of what Paul writes are a little hard to understand. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. So people who are novices and they, they don't understand the spiritual things, they, they struggle with it. And then he said, as they do other scriptures. That's the key, the word other scriptures. So what he's talking about, usually in the, in the New Testament, because the New Testament wasn't written yet, when they talk about the scriptures, they're talking about what we call the Old Testament. If you want to be politically correct, it's the former testament. And um, if you don't want to be, <laughs> some of you don't care, it's the Old Testament. But they would call that the scriptures. So when Peter refers to Paul's writings as other scriptures, he's affirming that Paul's epistles are also scripture. That's why that verse is so important. Yes? Really quickly, what's crazy to me is how he knew. Like how he's saying, like, they're kind of hard to understand. But like, once you get them, you know. <laughs> well, Paul, Peter himself had started off as a fisherman. Now, he, the Holy Spirit gives us illumination. I've met people, before they come to the Lord, they were as dense as a, as a rock. And, um, after they came to the Lord, the Lord was able, I don't know if it was they quit doing drugs, I don't know what it was, but they just seemed smarter after they came, became believers. And they had more common sense. They just... He lets you be you. <laughs> yeah, if you cast off the bondage of sin. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up with this real quick. I'm going to do it in five minutes, and it's just going to whet your appetite. You're going to have to do your own research. Um, so when you're... There are people who read the Bible and they're literalists. So if it says God hath arisen with healing in his wings, a literalist, literalist believes God has wings. The Bible clearly says God is a spirit. spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. Does God have wings? A literalist, a literalist says yes. Someone who understands the nature of Poetry understands the symbolism involved there. The imagery as a mother hen gathers her chicks. You know, what a beautiful picture, right? And God's not a chicken. <laughs> so poetry, when you read Hebrew poetry, even today when we write poetry, it's full of symbolic language that we know people aren't going to take literally, but you got the literalists, they read through it and they take it literally. Proverbs. They can relate to it. Maybe. A mental picture. Yeah. And so Proverbs, likewise, represent generalized statements of truth. And uh, But here's a question. A friend of mine, there's a place in the Bible that says, you know, um, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the earth. And this guy, he was a pastor at Lawrenceville Church of God when I was there, John Cobalt. John died when he was 61, a year younger than I am now. And uh, his wife, Gloria, a beautiful woman, she really struggled with this. She said, she would ask me... Doesn't the Bible say that your days may be long upon the earth? 
He treated his mother and father like kings and queens. And he died when he was 61. Isn't that a promise in the Bible? And, and I said, well, Proverbs aren't always direct promises. And here's the thing. Because he honored his father and his mother, he may have lived longer than he would have otherwise. Can we say, like, God picks his favorites? God what? God picks his favorites. Like, you may hear somebody, like, special, super special die in a car accident or something like that. Oh, yeah, like God takes someone, you know. That. I used to hear that, that kind of poetry when someone would die. They'd say, God plucked the beautiful rose in the garden. I think it helps us get through maybe... Um, there's nothing very theological about that, but uh, it can help people deal yeah. with loss. It's like more comfort. And, and then parables, you have to understand the nature of parables. Parables usually are intended to illustrate one main point. Sometimes people get all caught up in all the details of the parable and they miss the point. Usually there's a point that's being made and they're using the whole story to illustrate that single point. Apocryphal literature is filled with uh, visionary language that's otherworldly. And what does it mean? So I used to, I think I shared this with you, I used to believe that in Revelation when it talks about these uh, locusts or, or the, the creature that had the face of a man, the sound of thunder and hooves and all this stuff, that he was describing a helicopter because you see the face of people in the helicopter and, or the scorpions being tanks and whatever. And uh, that's the way I always thought until I talked to my professor, Hollis Gauss. And Hollis Gauss, who wrote a book on Revelation, he said, John saw what he said he saw. But what it means, it's apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature is filled with symbolic imagery. And some of it you won't understand until it comes to pass. Remember, Jesus kept warning his, um, I'm not going to get into all this. I'm going to wrap it up so you can go. But um, um, Jesus kept telling the disciples that the Son of Man must be crucified, handed over in the hands of sinners and be crucified. And three days, he, he said that multiple times. I mean, we have the few times in the Bible. He probably said it more than that. Everything Jesus said and in the Bible. But that's something he repeated. And they just didn't get it. In fact, Peter tried to rebuke Jesus at one time. Far be it from thee. And Jesus like, get behind me, Satan. Thou savior, not the things of God, but of man. He just got through saying, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father is in heaven. And now it's like, oh. And then later in John's gospel, after Jesus is resurrected, and I don't know if it was after he ascends or what, but it's after he resurrected, you find this phrase in the Bible, and it says, then they understood. After the fact, right? They couldn't get it ahead of time. After the death, after the cross, after the grave, after the resurrection, it says, it's like the light went on. Then they understood. And I think in life, there are certain things, especially with respect to, I know uh, Dr. Uh, Jones is teaching on Revelation. You can watch him online on his Facebook. He just started tonight, or last night? Last night, yes. And uh, here's the thing. I think a lot of what we see in there that we struggle with, after it transpires, we're going to be like, oh, yeah. That's so obvious. <laughs> How did I not see that? And I think I, I wrote a book. I haven't published it yet. I'm, oh, i got so many things I'm trying to edit right now. But... Um, and at the conclusion of my book, I said this. I feel like the people, and you can use this, uh, the people who think they have Revelation figured out with all their charts and they can explain it from start to finish are going to be the most surprised when it all goes down because they're going to think, Jesus did not consult my charts. <laughs> so anyway, I want to dismiss you. I have these uh, tickets for you. Um, I am, I'm going to try, try to encourage people. In addition to the offering, if you have an offering, we have it here. Uh, for people, if you can, you don't have to. I'm trying to get enough money to cover the woman's gas who delivers this. And so I'm going to try to ask everybody that comes if they can bring a donation of $5. You, I mean, you can walk, around, walk out of there with $100 worth of groceries easy. Um, but um, $5 will help us with the gas, and we'll collect that when we get over there. Um, but let's dismiss in prayer, and then please head right over there. Heavenly Father, we love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the church of God. I thank you that we stand, that we open up by saying we believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. It is your word. It's living. It still speaks to us with relevancy and authority. And God, help us always to yield our will to you and your word in all things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, bless you.